Good evening. Welcome to the last segment of the sixth annual INET plenary. I think this is a rather extraordinary way to conclude things, but uh, you can tell me what you think after dinner. I'd like to introduce William Janeway, who is one of the co-founders of INET and uh, just an extraordinary businessman, extraordinary intellectual, extraordinary economist. Bill? Thank you, Rob. Theorist practitioner is a term I first heard used by the great and no longer neglected economist, Hyman Minsky. That term has stayed with me because he actually, in making an introduction, applied it to me. Now, I want to redeploy that term at a scale that is amplified by orders of magnitude. Because George Soros is a theorist practitioner who has drawn upon his deep mastery of the financial markets and both the sources and consequences of what happens in financial markets for the real economy to develop and define a framework through which it is possible to understand what is going on. In doing that, George follows a very small number of people whose names you will know. The two that come to mind are David Ricardo and John Maynard Keynes. And with that, George, I would very much like to invite you out here to enter into conversation with Christia Freeland, also a hybrid who moved from a brilliant career as a commentator on economics and finance to an active role as a progressive politician and member of parliament in Canada. And I only hope that Christia's work in Canada will spill over south of the border to the United States. With that, thank you very much. By the way, I consider myself a practitioner of fallibility. <laughs> we'll, we'll see how, how well you fail tonight, George. Um, okay, thank you everybody for being here. Um, we, uh, George's team felt that the space was not really conducive to Q&A because it's such a long haul. So it's just going to be me asking George questions, and I'm going to try to channel all the questions that everyone would have wanted me to ask. You can yell at me afterwards if I don't ask the right ones. Um, okay, so George, um, the Munich Security Conference this year, which you spoke at, uh, had the title Global Disorder. I is that right? Are we living in a particularly disordered time? That's one of your areas of expertise. What's going on? No, I, I agree with that uh, because uh, the global governance is failing and you have all kinds of crises all over the world and instead of, uh, and they, they might be solvable uh, by themselves, but actually they fester. They, they don't get solved, and they accumulate, and, uh, uh, and uh, they are all interconnected in a reflexive fashion, uh, uh, affected, uh, affecting the others and being affected by them. Uh, and the uh, losers in uh, particular uh, crises become spoilers in the other crises. And that's what makes it so difficult to resolve them. So uh, the world is becoming extremely complicated. Until a few months ago, I thought I could sort of follow most of them, uh, the crisis in the world. But it has become, I think, practically impossible. 
uh, particularly in the Middle East, because there the, the, uh, the, uh, the enemies of your enemies used to be your friend, but that's no longer true, and that makes things extremely complicated. Um, okay, George, I wondered when we would get to reflexivity, and I have a timer here in front of me. You hit it at 1 minute 30 seconds, so that's pretty good. <laughs> um, okay, so crises. Um, let's move and focus specifically on Europe, where we are. Um, you have spoken often and written about the power of the European idea as a very inspiring idea. You've even talked about it as a fantastical object for you. That seems quite distant from Europe today. But talk, talk a little bit about that. Yeah. Well, I, I wrote a book, uh, The Tragedy of the European Union. And to sum it up, uh, it, the, the European Union was a, a very inspiring idea for people like me. I, I considered it the embodiment of the idea of an open society. Uh, uh, like-minded countries getting together, sacrificing part of their uh, sovereignty for the common good. Uh, and it was meant to be a, a voluntary association of equals. And because of the Euro crisis, it has already been uh, transformed into something radically different, uh, because the Euro crisis uh, created a difference between creditors and debtors. Uh, so those are two different classes. And, and uh, uh, the, the debtors had difficulties in meeting their obligations, and that put the creditors in charge. And uh, the, they set the rules, and the rules that they set made it very difficult for the debtors to exit their uh, inferior status. And, uh, and uh, so the, this voluntary association of equals uh, turned into an involuntary association of, of unequals. And, and uh, for people uh, under 50 today, uh, for, for me, for the older generation, Europe was an inspiring idea. But for the young people, particularly in the heavily indebted countries, uh, the European Union seems to be the enemy because it, it, uh, uh, it has made their uh, future uh, uncertain and not very appealing. Uh, so uh, the European Union is uh, currently in deep trouble. Is there a way out? Can this fantastical object be saved, or is the European Union now, as you've written, as you just said, a foreign oppressor for young Europeans? Well, basically, um, the, the, you know, the, the euro is here to stay uh, because uh, Draghi has said, uh, you know, do whatever it takes. Uh, to, to make it work, and he had the backing of Angela Merkel in, in doing that. So he had the, the ability to deliver on that. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, so it's the financial crisis has, has largely uh, been tra uh, transformed into a, a sort of emerging and developing uh, political uh, uh, crisis. But Europe has been very good at muddling through. But now you have two uh, um, existential crises, uh, 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 Greece and Ukraine. And two crises at the same time may be a little bit too much. So there's a danger that this time the muddling through won't work. Okay, so let's talk about those crises. Um, maybe start with Greece. You've described it as an existential crisis. Well, uh, Ukraine uh, uh, was mishandled from the beginning by all parties concerned. Uh, and uh, it got worse and, and, and worse. So actually, uh, now, 
the best you can, the most constructive outcome is muddling through. Uh, uh, but uh, Ukraine is very different. And unfortunately, the European Union uh, treats uh, Ukraine as yet another Greece. And that is absolutely uh, the wrong approach. Okay, so why is it so wrong? I mean, from a distance, you could see a lot of similarities, right? You know, both countries celebrating Easter this weekend. They have oligarchs. They have kind of crumbling governments. Aren't, is it, don't they have a lot in common? Yeah, well, uh, uh, Ukraine was very much like Greece with oligarchs, uh, a, a, a non-functioning government, uh, uh, the a bureaucracy uh, that was in many ways uh, 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 using its position uh, to, for private gain rather than to serve the people. Uh, so those, are, so uh, uh, Greece uh, resembles, uh, has many similarities to the old Ukraine. But there is a, what I call a new Ukraine, which is uh, uh, determined to be uh, to uh, get rid of all the uh, the, um, the rottenness of of uh, the old Ukraine, and that's the new Ukraine that uh, um, Europe has difficulty in uh, recognizing. And so they, that's why they treat uh, 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 Ukraine like the old Ukraine, or as they as uh, like Greece. And 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 what's the difference? I mean, what makes the new Ukraine new? Well, uh, it's it's uh, really uh, a a um, basically the rise of civil society uh, that. Uh, uh, spontaneously uh, uh, rebelled uh, against a continuation when uh, um, the association agreement uh, was offered and then uh, 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 put in uh, outbid the, uh, uh, the European Union, which wasn't very difficult, uh, uh, and offered 15 billion uh, uh, dollars uh, and Yanukovych uh, then uh, made a deal with with uh, uh, with uh, Putin, uh, and the people then uh, rebelled. They went to Maidan and they protested, uh, and uh, uh, Putin said to uh, Yanukovych, "Before you get your first three billion, you've got to." Uh, get rid of those people in Maidan. That's a con uh, that's, and uh, basically ordered uh, Yanukovych to use force. And this was a fatal mistake on the part of Putin that he's now trying to remedy as best he can uh, because uh, uh, he simply is with not within his view of the world to, to believe that people will actually act uh, uh, spontaneously uh, and, and uh, even risk their lives uh, for uh, a political cause. Uh, so uh, um, uh, uh, when uh, they wanted to clear the, uh, the square, uh, uh, people, instead of running away, uh, ran to Maidan, and that was the first time uh, that uh, 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 Yanukovych actually uh, was forced out of power. And then, uh, when he was already out of power, uh, uh, and already Putin was in so Sochi and had Yanukovych brought to him and ordered him uh, to uh, use live ammunition, which was in uh, February 
of, of 2014, uh, again, the people, instead of uh, running away, actually attacked uh, the, the uh, snipers and chased them away. And that was sort of a, 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 a very remarkable e event, and that was the birth of the new Ukraine. Is that, was that, George, civil society in action? You've been working on helping to build civil society, trying to build it, often frustrated uh, in the former Soviet Union, in the Soviet Union. I know you started, I first met you in Ukraine in 1990 when you began those efforts. There were many years, I think, when it seemed it was all useless. Um, does it say something to you, teach you something mm. about open society, civil society well, building? Well, yes, because basically, in many ways, uh, I set up the foundation in Ukraine in 1990, uh, uh, which was two years before the independence of Ukraine. That was part, it, it was a, an offshoot of the uh, uh, foundation in Russia. You know, as a, uh, I set up a, a cultural initiative foundation in uh, in uh, um, in in, in uh, the Soviet Union uh, in 1987, uh, and then uh, we built this branch in in Ukraine in uh, 1990, um, and, and uh, uh, the foundation. One of the the things that the foundation did uh, gave a lot of scholarships and and, and uh, supported civil society. And uh, the maturity of civil society 25 years later is to a large extent uh, uh, the work of the foundation. Yeah, and I will just offer my own personal testimony here. It's actually amazing in Ukraine, the new Ukrainian government, the new Ukrainian leadership, Everyone who I know in that group has been touched somehow by open society and by George, like literally, either people personally got a scholarship or someone, you know, their wife got a scholarship. It, it's a, a really remarkable thing. Well, this is, a, 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 for me, uh, a, quite an experience uh, to see this. And I, I didn't realize, actually, uh, uh, how much, uh, how big an effect it has had over a 25-year period? Because those were students. Uh, the, 25 years later, they were leaders. Um, so, George, the way you describe Ukraine, and you know that's where my own sympathies lie, also, um, is incredibly appealing. It maybe is another one of these fantastical objects, but not all Europeans agree with us. Um, the leader of your own homeland, Hungary, has described Putin as a model, as a role model. Uh, we have political leaders across Europe. We have the Greeks right now making trips to Moscow. We have in France uh, Marianne Le Pen having close contacts with Putin. What? What? How do you explain this influence, this appeal that Putin has in Europe? Yeah. Well, uh, I think. I can take a, 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 a historical uh, perspective because I was very much involved in uh, the collapse of the Soviet system. Uh, that was my debut uh, as a, what I uh, call myself a, a political philanthropist. Uh, and uh, um, this is uh, déjà vu for me. Uh, uh, but there are some fundamental differences between now and, 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 and then. Uh, because uh, in then it was a collapsing, a moribund Soviet Union that really collapsed of its own weight. Uh, and you had uh, the European Union emerging. It was, a, uh, an, as you uh, uh, call it, a, 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 a fantastic object 
that was very, very attractive. I was really, a, and I still am, a, a great believer in that uh, idea. Uh, so that's the big difference, because now you have a resurgent Russia. Uh, a, a, a country that has gone through a, a great deal of, uh, we had a, basically a, a revolution and a restoration. And the restoration brought about a, a new uh, uh, form of more or less the same kind of regime, but in, it, had, it has, uh, instead of uh, a kind of an international uh, 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 universal thing. It's based on nationalism. And in fact, it's sort of a, a, a two roots. Uh, one is sort of ethnic, the, uh, uh, the uh, exceptionalism of the Slavic race, and holy Russia. So. Uh, uh, this is a more, uh, 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 it's a new ideology and very effective. And it's uh, based on a lot of resentment. Uh, in that respect, it's, uh, in, it's resembling uh, uh, interwar Germany, uh, the, the, basically the Nazi uh, regime, which is also nationalistic and also based on uh, resentment. Um, and it's, it's got uh, considerable uh, uh, vigor. Uh, well, that's a very frightening parallel you've just drawn. Um, you've spoken, George, and written about how Russia and Putin has the tactical advantage in his confrontations. Um, why is that, and is there any way to shift what's happening on that chessboard? Well, uh, uh, Putin is definitely the initiator, uh, but uh, he's not, he's acting uh, uh, out of a weak position, and one should not, uh, although he's temporarily successful, one should not uh, ignore uh, the fundamental weakness of that regime, uh, which is uh, uh, basically uh, an exploitative uh, regime. Uh, it's uh, uh, a small clique of, of people are basically uh, uh, using uh, their position as rulers to um, well, earn rents, if you like, uh, collect uh, tributes, uh, and uh, um, uh, have an ideology that uh, gets support, but basically exploiting uh, the people. So one thing one should uh, not identify uh, Russia and the interests, let's say, the geopolitical uh, interests of Russia with the uh, Putin regime, because the Putin regime's first interest is to preserve itself in, in power and to m maximize its rents. And how weak it is, is shown by the people who do the exploitation and send, send the rents abroad. One of the fundamental weaknesses of, of the Russian system is, is that the, 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 the capital flight, because the people uh, have no confidence in, uh, in, the, uh, in the regime itself, and they realize that they, the, their ill-gotten gains could be taken away from them at any time, unless they, they uh, send it abroad. So they uh, basically send their children abroad to be educated abroad, and they send their, their, their ill-gotten gains abroad. 
You have described in pretty stark terms, George, these, you know, the disorder in the world and in particular the two existential crises Europe faces. Angela Merkel is clearly the most powerful leader in Europe. How do you think she's doing, dealing with these challenges? Well, she, she has acted as a European statesman in uh, confronting uh, uh, the threat of uh, Putin's Russia and, uh, and has gone further. Uh, uh, a democratic uh, leader uh, tends to uh, follow public opinion rather than lead it. Uh, but here she was actually, she, she stuck her neck out um, much further on that issue than on any other. So she, she, she I think partly because of her, her background in, in, uh, in Eastern, East, East Germany, um, uh, she recognized it early. Um, uh, so she has been at in that sense, a true uh, leader of, of, of Europe. Uh, but uh, she also has uh, some uh, misconceptions, uh, particularly in the, in, uh, in the economic sphere, uh, austerity and the, the, the uh, sort of the Bundes, Bundesbank uh, uh, orthodoxy. So, uh, I mean, the, the, to understand the uh, uh, the um, situation, you do need uh, new economic thinking. Well, good that we're here then. Um, is a Europe which is constrained by this Bundesbank austerity going to have the political will and the vigor to respond to these big existential challenges? Well, that's that's really. Uh, the big uh, uh, issue, because uh, as I said earlier, uh, at, at the moment, uh, treating um, uh, Ukraine as yet another Greece is the wrong uh, um, approach. And if you persist in it, eventually uh, um, Ukraine could turn into another Greece. That is to say that the new Ukraine uh, could become like the old Ukraine under the stress of uh, this, uh, what you might call drip feeding, uh, because uh, uh, the support that, you, uh, econ economic support that, that uh, Ukraine needs is, is always coming too late and too little. As we've discussed, you've been involved in Ukraine and in the former Soviet Union for many, many years. You recently made quite a dramatic announcement about being willing to really put your money where your mouth is when it comes to Ukraine. This announcement of a possible $1 billion investment, private business investment in Ukraine. Um, it reminded me a little bit of, remember that Russian investment? Um, when you well, got I, very I, excited. I, I, uh, well, I hope I hope that I won't repeat. As I as I start, uh, I mentioned earlier, I'm a practitioner of, of, of fallibility. But I hope that uh, th this time I won't make the same. I think making the same mistake twice would be too much. I agree. Um, so what motivates? So having made that Russian mistake, having been very open with yourself and the world about it being a mistake. What's motivated you to put this idea forward, and do you think it will actually be possible? Is, is it going to help lead the change? Well, th that uh, comes back to your earlier question of is there a way of, to regain uh, in the initiative? And I think there has to be a, 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 a way, and if uh, um, that could be accomplished, then Ukraine would be a very attractive investment opportunity. So uh, uh, I think uh, the possibility of, uh, of turning the situation around is there. Uh, but right now, uh, Ukraine, uh, Putin is actually gaining ground in, in uh, or has been gaining ground. Actually, 
I rather think that we may have passed the peak of that. Uh, it's a little too early to say, but I think just the events of the last uh, week or two give me hope that we, it actually may be, we have uh, sort of, it's always uh, uh, a dark, uh, uh, darkest before dawn. Uh, I see some signs of, of uh, the thing turning around, and that we can go into it why. But uh, um, at any rate, uh, uh, Putin has had the the initiative, and he she's, he still does have that because uh, um, his aim, his his optimum aim, aim in Ukraine is not to have a military victory that would give him uh, uh, control over part of uh, uh, Ukraine, mainly eastern part, uh, but also responsibility uh, for, the, for uh, with control goes responsibility. Uh, uh, so he doesn't want part of Ukraine. Uh, he wants to destabilize all of Ukraine, and preferably in a way that he can disclaim uh, responsibility. That's his, his sort of uh, the, the maximum that he's aiming for. And he's willing to, uh, he's already shown, so I'm not, I'm not, this is not a construction on my part or a guess. It's, it's his demonstrated behavior because uh, twice, he has traded in, converted uh, uh, a sure uh, military victory I into a ceasefire uh, that would uh, 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 hopefully bring about a, a financial crisis and a political uh, a collapse of, of Ukraine. That's, is, this was Minsk 1 and Minsk 2. And if you compare the two, uh, you can see how much progress he has made on the ground. And uh, those, uh, that has been acknowledged, uh, recognized. And at the same time, he has not given up uh, uh, any of his options. So he can switch with, from a hybrid war to hybrid peace. Or, uh, and, and, and back again. So he has the initiative. So you need to, re first of all, get equal and have options. And, and, uh, and uh, uh, having done that, uh, ev eventually you could, and then you need a strategy that would uh, um, um, change uh, the, the current regime where uh, Ukraine is barely given uh, enough uh, to survive, to uh, uh, actually uh, be, uh, being given a lot more uh, 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 budgetary support uh, and also uh, uh, additional support that would attract private capital because it's it's really the inflow of private capital that would make the Ukrainian economy work. I've heard there's a hedge fund guy in New York who wants to invest a billion dollars, so that's a start. Well, that's exactly why I, I, I put it up there. And just for the record, I made it clear that uh, it is for profit, not, not for loss. Uh, uh, but the profits will go to the foundation and not to me uh, personally, so that I can't be accused of, you know, just uh, uh, doing it to, uh, to make a killing. But I think uh, uh, that if things work out well, I would make a killing by, uh, by investing in Ukraine.
Okay, so George, I've been suffering some cognitive dissonance in this conversation because here we are probably in the most magnificent room in which I have ever interviewed anybody. Um, people who didn't have to talk like us were having some magnificent champagne and yet you're talking about these twin existential crises facing Europe. You made a very terrifying allusion to the Weimar period. Um, can you sketch out, can you imagine, is, is there a positive scenario? Does Europe and the world get out of these twin existential crises and this global disorder? Can you yeah. cheer us up before supper? Yeah, no, I, I, I think, first of all, I, I think that the uh, Ukrainian uh, situation is uh, 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 at least as important as, as Greece and it has a great, much greater hope of a polit uh, positive outcome uh, because as I said Ukraine, uh, Greece is a kind of poisoned situation where everybody has all sides uh, have made uh, uh, lots of mistakes uh, and there is a, a, a lot of uh, uh, hostility uh, and a and, uh, uh, lot of negative sentiments so much so that both sides seem uh, uh, have a te uh, are willing to uh, do something to hurt the other side uh, uh, even if it hurts them as long as it hurts the, the other side more. So uh, um, uh, if you want to go back to, well, uh, we can go back to Greece. Uh, uh, if uh, uh, you could muddle through by, instead of actually writing off the debt, just extend it, extend and pretend, and, uh, and uh, just uh, uh, keep the, uh, the primary surplus somewhere between one and a half and three percent uh, and uh, 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 that would be the muddling through but instead of primary surplus because of the, the the way it is being handled you don't have a primary surplus now because the, uh, the Greek economy has actually uh, co collapsed so that gives you an idea of how, uh, how uh, poisoned that, that situation is. Now, uh, let, uh, shall we, uh, let's go to Ukraine. And uh, there, uh, if uh, I, I said three conditions for uh, making an investment uh, and a profitable investment in Ukraine, one is that the uh, uh, allies uh, of Ukraine have to uh, uh, make a political commitment uh, to do what it takes, uh, using Draghi's famous uh, uh, term, uh, uh, to help Ukraine not only to survive, but actually to flourish. What happened? We've hit the 35 minute mark, George, but uh, it's your show, so I think you can carry on. We're talking about Ukraine flourishing now. Uh, the three conditions for the investment. Yeah, yeah, okay, so the first one is, is this uh, uh, take, uh, 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 commitment, a political commitment. The second, you have to find a source of, of uh, uh, financing that uh, uh, that uh, would enable uh, uh, Europe to give the uh, 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 financial assistance on a much larger scale and in a in an appropriate manner uh, and in particular to provide political risk insurance. Uh, for people investing in Ukraine, because that's what would provide the incentive uh, to invest there. And uh, third, you have to enable, or you have to have 
uh, a lasting um, uh, ceasefire. Uh, and for that, uh, Ukraine has to be able to rebuild its ability uh, to uh, put up resistance in case uh, Putin decides to move from uh, uh, hybrid peace to hybrid war. Because when he sees Ukraine succeeding, he would, he would be uh, more than tempted to do it. And so there has to be a, a, a cost that would prevent him from doing that. So uh, f for that, you need to then have a strategy, a winning strategy, which is that it's not enough to have sanctions. Uh, because sanctions merely reinforce Putin's narrative that all his problems are due to the, uh, to the hostility of the, of the West, the determination of the West to destroy uh, 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 Russia. And that's a, a valid narrative, and people in Russia actually believe it. And that would enable Putin to, uh, to take a lot of pain uh, and survive, just as Ukraine is uh, taking a lot of pain and surviving. So uh, the only way you could put, uh, put, uh, put the lie to it, if uh, the sanctions were counterbalanced by uh, effective assistance uh, to Ukraine that would enable Ukraine to flourish, not just to survive, because then Ukraine would turn into a, a, a role model for uh, people who are currently uh, under, under uh, Putin's domination uh, to try to imitate it. And that would then bring about uh, uh, eventually a change in Russia. So this, these are the stakes. Okay, those are pretty high stakes, and I'm very pleased that we're concluding on a note not of interwar Germany, but of a return to democracy in Russia. Um, thank you so much, George. It's a pleasure to Good. listen to you for me.